two, which follows from one, as uh, particularly contemporary because it engages with issues of environmental ecology. But it's not just that their work engages environmental ecology, it's that their work engages environmental ecology because those ideas themselves are so much in debate. Um, they're being reformed and reconsidered and contested from, from the vantage point of probably almost every other discipline you could think of. And this to me seems like something that's particularly an apt characterization of our present condition, that few things are more acutely felt than the pressure climate, uh, the pressures that climate crisis is exerting on our social, political, and of course ecological conditions. So the arts are not immune to these pressures, and there are a number of artists working through these problems through their practices. But there's another interesting element at play here, which is that the growing importance of, of aesthetics to ecological and environmental research. Aesthetics aren't just a framing of research anymore. They're operable across domains. Um, ecological aesthetics are mobilized in the service of policy making, so they dictate how and in what ways we can interact and intervene in the physical world. Ecological aesthetics are operable in the collecting and sharing of ecological data, telling us what we know and what is possible to know about the physical world, and so on and so forth. And this animating of ecological aesthetics is in part furnished through the use of newer technologies like GPS, satellite imagery, uh, sensing technologies, but also as well through the innovation of existing technologies, so photography and image manip manipulation. So given all this, it's not only is it just interesting to talk about this kind of work and the ways artists are using our present condition as an impetus for creativity, but it, it also marks an important contribution to the ongoing conversation that the entire socio-political sphere is having with itself, trying to firmly place our human selves and all of human history in the context of this environment that is quite literally crumbling and, and melting and transforming beneath our feet and all around us. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. I'm going to start with Brett. Unfortunately, Susan Shipley was supposed to be here, but sends her regrets that she can't make it. She's provided a clip from her um, one of her works, Atmospheric Feedback Loops, which I'm not sure if we'll be able to screen, but I can give anyone the relevant information to track down that work if it's of interest to you. Um, and we've also got Fiona Crisp, who will be coming up after Brett. So Brett Zaner is an artist, researcher, and PhD student in performance studies and science and technology studies at Brown University in the United States. <clears throat> he is currently researching the relation between art and meteorology in the production of environmental subjectivity within climate change discourse. Great. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Brett. Um, I'm really excited to be here in London for the Sluice Art Fair. Uh, and I want to thank Nicole um, for organizing these really interesting panels. I'm very honored to be here. Um, so I'll be presenting some uh, brand new work today. Uh, so I'll be looking forward to the discussion afterwards, hopefully over a pint. Um, OK, so in my own research, uh, I've been really interested uh, in the atmosphere as both a material space and a representational schema. Between matter and data, the atmosphere creates distinct problems for political theorization across scale. For instance, political theory is rife with concerns about atmospheric control. Peter Sloterdijk, in his book, Terror from the Air, speaks about the shift from hand-to-hand -hand combat in the First World War to the use of gas attacks. The target was no longer the individual soldier, rather an indirect ambient target, that of the enemy's environment. The emergence of a dark meteorology Militarizing atmospheric conditions in the early 20th century turned the respiratory system into an apparatus of self-destruction. This is what Slaughterdyke has called the birth of terrorism. I think this analysis can be extended to the slow and oblique violence of climate change. Here, the atmosphere is a medium through which control and dominance is enacted. Perhaps not directly from body to body or agent to agent, but in diffuse control over the general environment. The atmosphere becomes the living archive of social repression and environmental damage, an oblique passage through environmental politics. At all scales, environmental management is bound to an attempt to govern the ungovernable and to protect against the outside normative thought. 
One mode in which the atmosphere is the medium of ambient social control is at the level of embodiment. For instance, who has the right to breathe? It may seem horrific, yet the very right to breathe has been called into question through police violence, as in the case of Eric Garner. The very air itself has become historically racialized. During the Second World War, the architectural design of Japanese internment camps specified the exact cubic inches of air that each inmate would breathe. Going further, Christina Sharp in her recent book, In the Wake, describes the weather as the totality of our environment. The weather is the total climate where the air of freedom is profoundly hegemonic and predicated on racist enclosure. Yet the weather also opens up possibility for sure. The weather necessitates changeability and improvisation. It's the atmospheric condition of time and place, and it produces new ecologies. The atmosphere then, in a materialist and metaphysical sense, makes power relations sensible in a living archive, while also offering us opportunities for creativity. This is all to say, uh, to riff on a famous idiom by Marshall McLuhan, that all that is solid melts into the air. Materiality bleeds into representation. A planetary scale project is underway, connecting sensory information, data bodies, and protocols all predicting and simulating storms, financial markets, even urban unrest. This is a body politic that is impoverished. We are deeply embroiled in a networked pessimism. Moreover, as media technology and subjectivities proliferate, countless species are vanishing into a dead silence. This is a troubling slippage between the aesthetic experience of the atmosphere and a choreography of subjectivity seeping into the background of everyday life. As Benjamin Bratton illustrates in his latest book on planetary computation, the data cloud is extractive of subjects. Algorithmic governance bypasses the individual decision maker, while the cloud draws its energy from fragmented users. This so-called cognitive capital has partially become dematerialized. Yet the danger this point of view poses is in masking exploited labor and the infrastructures undergirding late capitalism. Even still, despite the troubling uh, boundary between material and immaterial, we seem to have moved away from a politics founded on liberal decision makers toward automated, choreographed, and ambient forms of politics. All right, so what does all this have to do with art? Um, contemporary art, I think, excels at creating self-defined forms of value by determining itself as a kind of knowledge production or an approach to the world which is valuable in its own sense. Art intervenes within economies of scale and within economies of value production. Yet is art inherently separate from these systems? No. There is clearly an art market connected by all kinds of institutions, both profitable and based on nonprofit models. Yet contemporary art also exists in a necessary outside where capital reaches for new objects and practices to commodify. Art exists in this fold, in this transitional space, and it defines new modes of production. And in terms of value, I think uh, there's this interesting process within environmental art um, which attempts to define the intrinsic value of nature. Uh, we see in the history of environmental art, uh, from landscape art to the new topographers, uh, and even the experimental geographers that we see today, uh, we see claims and gestures that try to relate the earth uh, through novel modes of production. So for instance, here we see uh, Trevor Paglin, who recently created a non-functional satellite to be placed into orbit. Uh, he merely wants to mark space itself as a vector of intrinsic value. And what I'm fascinated by in uh, environmental art is the ability to disrupt the notion of a certain kind of an art consumer, a certain kind of subject who is in a normative relationship to the earth. So if we were to take seriously cloud politics, attempting to bypass the individual subject, I think we should think through forms of art uh, that attempt to disrupt those very processes. This is where I think the potential for geographic art or geoesthetics lies. 
So I'd like to talk about three aesthetic strategies that I see playing out in the atmosphere of Paris. Uh, the first strategy I'll discuss is transparency. We see this a lot within architectural design uh, and within the cliched glass cubes of modernity. Transparency marks the conflation between the private and public spheres. We also see transparency as a tactic in contemporary terms of capitalism. Certain companies attempt to make their production processes transparent to the consuming public, as if by opening the doors of the factory and the supply chain, we will somehow feel that capitalism is a little bit less noxious. So here we see uh, Patagonia's website, tracking where all of their materials come from, mapping exactly where all their clothes are produced, and naming all of the workers in their supply chain. Patagonia owns their own production story. For them, this is a persuasive and open honesty, which will bring them a kind of brand, brand loyalty. Uh, this has everything to do with the atmosphere, as immaterial capital, as a vision machine, and as something to be revealed. Now, transparency, divided, despite its many uses, is a powerful tool, especially for documentary artists attempting to make injustices known. Donna Haraway claims that a world that is more accurately described will inevitably be a more just world. This is uh, perhaps yet to be seen. Another aesthetic form uh, that I'm interested in is the art of reflection, or art as a mirror. <coughs> This is fascinating to me in the way in which artists attempt to work with cloud physics to make provocative aesthetic gestures. So here we see the amazing uh, Blur building, which tempts visitors to literally cohabitate within a cloud. Carolina Sobelka also uses cloud physics uh, to create replicas of past atmospheres in miniature, or tiny climate reports. These artists display a fascinating mode of mimicry using geophysics to replicate and reproduce stand-ins of natural force. Maybe this can be seen as uh, geoengineering at an intimate scale, a kind of infusion of human agency into an uncertain climate. Now lastly, what I'm most interested in uh, is an art that makes socio-environmental processes malleable. Now what do I mean by this? Um, I'm fascinated by artists that use social relationships as a laboratory to refashion skills, knowledge, and tactics of power. An example of this is the Autonomous Astronauts, who were a group uh, from the 1990s, and they were part of the cyberpunk movement here in London. Uh, the astronauts wanted to communize off-Earth exploration to combat corporate exploitation of space imaginaries. The astronauts held extra extravagant techno-futurist raves in order to produce a social collective. But they also attempted their own illegal DIY space program, which tried to make malleable the socio-technical structures of the space age. The autonomous astronauts creatively worked within the realms of prediction and speculation. They were interested in expanding reality to expand notions of what is possible. And in my opinion, I think this is a kind of art which makes legible the illegible, which makes known the unknown, and creates a new relationship to time. All right, so uh, in order to work within these modes of research, a group of artists and scientists and I have uh, started something we call the People's Autonomous Weather Service. This is a research platform uh, designed to observe, record, and experiment with atmospheric phenomena. We've begun venturing into appropriating meteorology, which we think is the black magic of our era, uh, as a tool to intervene within predictive politics. Meteorology occupies a certain kind of poetics of translation. We're fascinated by translation between material systems and digital systems of knowing. We want to exist within what Eve Sedgwick calls the cybernetic fold where the digital is a realm dragged into the future through past material means. We're fascinated by categories of knowledge and the way that they slip or break and create new forms of practices which can more evenly share climate risk. Since much of the work in the People's Autonomous Weather Service is very much in its early days, uh, much of the rest will have to prove to be speculative. 
So who is the People's Autonomous Weather Service? The people are a people yet to come, a not already existing audience. Most apocalyptic films focus on individuals and their strife. Yet what of the group? What of the subject that is more than and less than the individual? We're interested in rethinking territory, not just based off of land use, but of more ephemeral risks of changing climates and atmospheres. Through fragility, risk, and atmospheric immersion, we wish to conspire, to breathe together. The autonomy of artificial intelligence, of big data, of automation, all burden us with externalized surplus labor. So how do we repurpose and reuse the remote sensing apparatuses? Do we have a capacity to occupy the break, the break in the algorithm? What role does prediction have over policing and financial speculation? How do we ethically wander away from the readable, knowable, measured quantity toward the unknown and the uncontrolled, a less precarious nature? We're interested in intervening in the weather, in the man-made weather of smogs, of superstorms, of methane. We wish to create experiential climate models, embodied, local, fragmented, and incomplete. We will labor over network repair, of disaster relief, of care without expectation. We are the civic arts from the limits of the sciences. So we are currently planning three phases of activity. The first phase is the development of an autonomous weather network in southern New England. We're currently researching the feasibility of building a network of DIY weather stations to blend atmospheric measurement with social reporting of atmospheric events. The air quality monitoring network in the US is surprisingly lacking in coverage. This is especially important in an area like southern New England, which sees a great disparity in air quality and air pollution across differences in population. So we wish to begin by engaging in that civic need to help better monitor the air quality. Uh, phase two will begin with the development of a weather laboratory. We'll experiment with atmospheric models to produce our own climate simulations built off of local community concerns. The lab will act as a way to predict and model the future, not only with speculations of sea level rise and atmospheric change from the top down, but with what communities may desire or fear in the coming years. So the lab will merge urban planning with media reportage uh, to engage the temporal politics of climate. In phase three, uh, we will actually shift gears to create a mobile lab engaged with civic mapping of climate risk. We've seen very recently in the US Professor of Fine Art at Northumbria University in Newcastle, and her work is represented by Matt's Gallery in London. Her current Leverhulme funded fellowship material site, representing the spaces of fundamental science, uses non documentary photography and video to interrogate extremes of visual and imaginative representation in fundamental science and technology. Based at three world leading research facilities, including the Laboratori Nazionale del Gran Sasso in Italy. The research places artistic production in the spaces where experimental and theoretical science is performed, foregrounding the site or laboratory as a social, cultural, and political space where meaning is shaped and constructed rather than received or observed. So, great. Thanks. Thanks, I didn't know you were going to read all that. <laughs> so, uh, so now just repeat most of it. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming and thanks Nicole for arranging um, the session and the breadth of that really interesting um, talk. Um, so, as Nicole said, my name's Fiona Chris. Um, I'm an academic, um, but first and foremost, I'm an artist. Um, and it's very much through the prism of practice that I'm going to approach the ideas I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Um, and I was saying earlier on to somebody that it's interesting for me to speak in this context because um, 
this area, this critical field that could loosely be termed the aesthetics of ecology, is not really somewhere where I've sort of consciously located my practice, but it's something that increasingly people are picking up on. So I was interested to come and um, share this with other people and um, hear the other speakers. So thinking about how Nicole proposed the parameters for this panel, it's, um, it's really the questions around how we evolve new images and image making in relation to landscape art and landscape, landscape art aesthetics um, that are kind of pertinent to me. Um, so material site, this is a, this is a large scale project um, that I'm currently working on with several different partners all of whom are in some way um, connected to fundamental science. And really at the root of the work is this conundrum of how we imaginatively um, connect and cognitively connect with extreme remoteness. So when I'm talking about remoteness, I mean remoteness of time and distance in extreme environments, remoteness of scale, from the macro scale of the universe to the subatomic world, and the remoteness of cognition itself um, in extreme science. Uh, so for instance, how we begin to assimilate something like seven or nine dimensions. But really importantly, all of this um, is approached through the act of looking for me. So using the still photograph or movie image to make what I consider to be non-documentary landscape images. So I'm going to start by giving you a bit of sort of visceral immersion, although we have it anyway with the trains going over our heads. Um, so I'm going to start with this film and I'm going to play it with sound and then I'm going to turn the sound down because obviously you don't want to be here for hands watching it. So I say when you're going to present to you the button so tight. to sort of really set a tone that acknowledges that these terms of non-documentary and also of landscape I'm using in a fairly kind of equivocal way. Um, so here we're looking at an extract of a film that I shot at Bulby Mine, which is on the North Yorkshire coast, and at over a kilometre deep. Um, it's a potash mine, but it's the, it's the UK's deepest working mine. But it also houses a dark matter research facility where, amongst other things, they're looking for the 95% of the universe that's currently unaccounted for. <laughs> so the mine itself stretches out, it's on the coast, it stretches out about nine kilometres underneath the seabed. So this film is charting the progress of this vehicle as it travels out underneath the sea towards the mining face. So I'm interested here in the paradoxical relationship between this material and um, powerfully phenomenological site, and that in relation to this immaterial, abstract nature of the science that's being pursued in that environment. And it's also the fact that since this environment is hermetic in so much as it's entirely bounded. And it's, it's sort of like a kind of reverse architecture in a way that's made through excavation rather than construction. But I do also think about it as a form of landscape. So equally, I've begun to think about this as a type of landscape too. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this as a still image. It's the deep field image that was taken by the Hubble telescope. And this is a, an animation of that still image that takes us back through space and time. So as we're moving back, we're moving back towards 
um, the very furthest reaches um, that the photograph um, documented, which is going back to the um, towards the beginning of um, of time as we know it. And this animation was made by um, some people at the Institute of Computational Cosmology at Durham University, who were, um, along with Bulby, um, the Dark Matter Laboratory there, the two of the partners on the Material Site Project. And it's been really interesting working with these guys because some of the simulations and visualizations are constructed entirely from data. And some, such as this deep field image, is premised on observational data, so it's actually what was photographed from the Hubble telescope, and so therefore related to the real. Um, so some of the conversations that I have been having with them at the Institute are very much related or spring from my questions um, about the limits and capabilities of photography and its indexical relationship to the world. But I'm also really interested in how these images are culturally perceived. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions I said was, how do you differentiate this from the beginning of Star Wars? Um, <laughs> which they actually responded to very well. So I just wanted to start with these two films, that one of Bowlby and this one um, of the deep field, um, as a kind of tuning fork in a way, I suppose, as to how I'm thinking about both the idea of the document and the idea of landscape. My roots are actually in sculptural practice, um, so in this respect I consider the language of mass, of space, of physical presence to be kind of my mother tongue. Um, but as I've indicated, I now work mainly with non-documentary photography and video making these types of large-scale installations where the viewer's spatial encounter with the work um, is quite carefully choreographed in a way in terms of the actual material encounter. And I think the other important thing to say is that the installations often make use of tropes of seating associated with different forms of public looking or reception of information sometimes church or meeting hall benches, gallery furniture, and in this instance, the ubiquitous park bench. So the seating, if it's successful, positions the viewer in relation to the work in visual and conceptual terms, but also at the same time it offers a kind of haptic encounter with the material surfaces that the viewer sits on that might elicit a simultaneous sense of kind of distance and intimacy. And much of the work plays with these dichotomies of interior and exterior space, of public and private space. And the seating role in that is central to both kind of splitting those realms and, and conflating them as well. So I describe the images themselves as non-documentary because despite the fact that photographs are in literal terms a document of a specific site, they have no documentary intent for me. And by this I mean that there's no narrative drive or conveyance of meaning beyond the image's own internal presence. And through or probably because of this approach, my interest lies much more in the ontology of the photographic object. So for instance, many of the films and images are made at sites of great phenomenological power, but paradoxically it's the photograph's inability to adequately embody presence what I think about it is, is its kind of phenomenological failure that fascinates me. And I'm also drawn to this kind of three-way schism that opens up between what the photograph is of, kind of in and of itself, um, and then how it stands in relation to the actual time and space it depicts, and then how the object behaves in the viewer's act of encounter. So it's within this triangulated relationship between image, sight and encounter that for me the coordinates of time, or space or states of being are either destabilised or reordered. And this allows instead for me a space to become manifest that we as viewers can't mentally re-inhabit. And I've come to think about this idea as kind of impossible space. So this 
touring exhibition Subterranea enabled me to bring together a number of distinct series of works of this nature that I'd evolved over quite a long period, probably about nine years with all the different series. And the sites range from a German military hospital in the Channel Islands to um, some images from Baldwin Underground Laboratory, where I'm still working, which is where the film is from. <laughs> there is quite a lot of detail in this. <laughs> you can come and sit on the screen. Um, so, collectively, the spaces were characterised by the fact that the usual markers of photography, in other words, light, time, space, culture, climate, were either distorted or, uh, or suspended altogether. So the earliest works in the exhibition dated from 2001 and were created with pinhole cameras in the early Christian catacombs of Rome. And apart from the anachronistic presence of safety lighting, these spaces had been in a state of virtual stasis for hundreds of years. Almost all indicators of geographic or cultural location were withheld, but the stability of light and climate in the catacombs are absolute. So in many ways the resultant photographs represent a tautology in so much as they're still images captured of spaces that are essentially already still or already dead. So within the long exposure of the large format film, and I think this one was about three hours, and like I say, it has got detail in it. This indeterminate time is opened up in that space of the image being made. And that time, for me, is between some time and no time. And similarly, in the suspended identity of the place, this space is created between somewhere and nowhere. And, and this is really um, how this idea of the impossible space begin to, began to evolve for me. So it's this relationship to photography and the photographic image as is is a deeply equivocal form that created the basis for my engagement as a layperson with extreme ro remoteness and fundamental science. Most non-scientists experience an imaginative lacuna when confronted with abstract ideas of scale and complexity associated with fundamental physics, astronomy or mathematics. When, as already mentioned, we attempt to approach the possibility of seven or nine dimensions, there's a kind of vertigo induced that can be recognised in his analytic of the sublime. And as the contemporary theorist James Elkins observed, it's a moment that can cause, as Alkin said, vertigo as compensation gives way to apprehension. Historically, Western culture has measured space and time through the body, but overwhelmingly we're denied these coordinates in relation to fundamental science and technology, where the twin extremes of the macro and the micro scale often operate beyond our perceptual and cognitive grasp. So this is the Laboratory Nationale de Gran Sasso, and there another key partner, as Nicole said, in my current project. Um, and the laboratory is the world's largest for particle physics, and it's sited here inside this mountain in central Italy. So over the last year, I have been working on top of the mountain, underneath the mountain, inside the mountain. So the following images, and um, I think one video clip that I'm going to show you as I'm talking through the rest of the presentation here, is, is working material um, from those kind of field trips. So it's not it's not finished work. So within this project, I'm asking if it's possible to approach that is which is literally or conceptually imperceptible by the seemingly perverse use of visual photographic means. But further to this, I'm asking if the desire for empirical knowledge could be suspended to engender a productive state of unknowing that might be termed productive doubt. So I'm just returning to another quote of Kant's here. There is in our imagination a striving towards infinite progress, and in our reason a claim for absolute totality regarded as the real idea. 
Therefore, this very inadequateness of that idea in our faculty for estimating the magnitude of things of sense excites in us the feeling of a supersensible faculty. So could the image and image making be some kind of conduit to this supersensible faculty? And if so, could photography and film contribute to a cultural negotiation of extreme science and technology, not through being utilised as a documentary tool, but by being used as a language that mirrors science's probing of the furthest reaches of imagination and comprehension by way of an opening up or a performing of an impossible space? Central to this thinking is the suspension of our desire for empirical knowledge to allow for this state of productive doubt. This could be useful in the context of scientists understanding how advances in their field are culturally connected, as well as for lay publics being able to imaginatively engage with those advances. Furthermore, productive doubt can provide artists and other cultural producers with a tool to think through the implications of scientific and technological advances via practice that might encourage the evolution of collaborative working relationships that genuinely advance knowledge across the arts, fundamental science and social science simultaneously. In this respect, I believe that there are conceptual and philosophical parallels in art practice that can potentially help us to imaginatively engage with technological and scientific advances, particularly with ideas of certainty, doubt, and the limits of imagination. Thank you. Great. Um, I'll just have Brett on the chair. Are there any questions? I think I, I will jump. I don't have a question just yet, but I'm, I think um, something I'm sort of struck by when I was looking at you're showing the work in the seat suit. I don't know where it is on my notes now. Um, Something that I think I'm struck by and that I'm trying to wrestle with in my own writings now is previously to make, you know, I think we've come to a point, especially with that deep field image, where an image being reasoned, like rational or something that we can understand, that responsibility would have been structured along a kind of perspectival schema. There would have been perspective to make you understand what you're seeing in your image. And it seems now we've shifted into a new period or time where that's sort of fallen away and now the rationality of those linear perspectives of the grid of, of any of that previous structuring has literally fallen away and it's to become for that deep field image to become re like rational or legible you have to literally animate it move through it it's very much tied its rationality is very much tied and linked to how it's animated and produced and received and distributed through media and mediated by media um, That's where I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still thinking. Yeah, it, was, it was really interesting to, to, to talk to them, actually, and, and especially this relationship between the visualisations that do come entirely from data and the visualisations that come from observational data as a kind of starting point. So, you know, I was, I was really interested, interested to try and kind of tease that out. But I think what I found fascinating was, especially the people who were building the visualizations entirely from data, they were still very much talking within that tradition of one point perspective. Oh, so, completely art historical. So, so yeah. this, this idea of, uh, of um, you know, that, that to start constructing the visualization, you have to think about where you are. Um, and, and this idea that actually, but what is that? Is, is that a body? Is it an eye? Is it, you know, and, and then of course they're working a lot with VR and so that you can sort of be in the middle of these environments and move around. But they've, they've only ever presented these as kind of scientific data. And if they, if they show it in a cultural setting or 
put it on YouTube or something, they usually put kind of Wagner on top of it or something to, to make it sort of suitably kind of um, kind of overawing in, in a way. But, but they've never sort of thought about how how somebody might come and actually experience that as, as a kind of embodied act. Um, which is this like antiquated frame of art history that's placed on top of this like very forward-thinking, at least this is something I found in my research, is very forward-thinking signs with visualizations. So that's even embedded and coded for in like the visualization software itself, like working with Maya or any of those 3D computer graphics, it asks you, it's like, it's completely based off of linear perspectives that go back to the origin of perspective, and it's building light, your light source off of that, and how that's going to affect and determine how the bodies move and respond to that light source. And, um, yeah, but there doesn't seem, there's a sort of disjuncture or an asymmetry in how that thinking art historically about scientific data that is made visual can then also evolve along with the arts and the, and the artistic image that, that itself has moved past those kind of classic um, paradigms. So I'm interested in, in, um, in that's, that sort of gap between knowledge and belief and our art can inhabit that gap. Um, and wonder what communities in New England, what sort of communities are you, is that kind of a project you've already kept looking at people you're going to work with or is it? Yeah. Is it? Um, well, for instance, in southern New England, a lot of uh, the disparity between who's at risk uh, for the future of climate change, rising sea levels, uh, it tends to be in sort of poorer communities and people who are not protected uh, by government infrastructure like hurricane barriers and dams and dikes and things like that. Uh, so we're trying to sort of occupy that space between scientific knowledge of what will be coming down the line, but also using that, uh, using I guess the aesthetic part of that or the artistic side of that to mobilize um, to mobilize against those kinds of futures, to try to do something with that. Uh, so I think science can be really powerful to, um, I guess, convince people to be sort of weary of these issues. But uh, I'm really mostly interested in where science becomes policy and where we can actually, uh, I mean, in the US, for instance, a lot of those policies are being sort of destroyed right now and people don't have access to what even climate change is, the climate data is disappearing. Uh, so I think the arts is a good way to sort of intervene in that space and to take up the labor of art um, as a civic science or something uh, to deal with the public or some participation. So that's the hope. Um, yeah. So like a notion of aesthetics, so yeah. articulating a society's sense of understanding of what yeah. What, what, what is that society that is the cultural that right. founds that society and what they understand and believe in? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of always been part of our history, our artists, and our right. always work like that. So there's actually no reason why I can't work in this instance. Yeah, exactly. So how do we interpret data? And then how do we interpret the images that are made from that data? And then where, how is that actually taken up by people who don't have those kinds of knowledges? And I think there's a lot of work to be done in translation. Um, so, so what, what academics are you working with and what's the policy makers in? Well, uh, at Brown, for instance, there's an Institute for Environment and Society, and one of their aims is to sort of uh, get science into the community. So we have uh, a couple climate scientists, grad students, a meteorologist, uh, a sound artist, and sort of varied media artists. Um, and we're trying to sort of piece together these, these ways of knowing the Earth and that's really difficult to talk for a climate scientist to talk to an artist and try to understand each other. So I think we're still in early days on even trying to articulate that kind of labor. Um, but I think even in that process, you can find exciting ways to, you know, try to learn more things about what's possible. I guess. Just to follow up on this, uh, how do you see the relationship between these people's autonomous weather? Service, service yeah. and the state. <laughs> because towards the end, you said that Good you would like pick up this kind of uh, role that is 
not being taken by the state and repairing houses and so on, and do it yourself, yeah. which would be, I guess, quite convenient for... It would be convenient for the state. state. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. That's a great question. I think uh, part of the danger is that within this like neoliberal governance structure, the state goes away and says, take care of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we are still very leery about this, uh, especially for what's happening in Puerto Rico or with Harvey. Uh, have you heard of the, the Cajun Navy, for instance, mm -hmm. came uh, instead of the US Navy, a bunch mm -hmm. of people brought fishing boats to save people from the flood. Uh, this is a symptom of neoliberalism, where the state just sits, behind, sits back mm -hmm. and you take care of yourself. Uh, but that also is to say that, that care is still needed. There is still uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. So I think occupying that space between the state and some other entity uh, could be a kind of new sort of politics. So that's the hope. But I think you're right to say that, wait a minute, the state can just sit back and sort of say, screw it, while we do all the work. I mean, it's a good question. But, yeah. but there's also that like critical moment after climate yeah. crisis that happens where kind of across <laughs> both sides, they, resources are mobilized and everyone's on board for helping. Right. And that seems like, a, and then it kind of dro and it drops away. Right. There's like a two month period and then all of a sudden everyone's like, you know, first it's like, oh, we'll open up all our, provide shelter to all, and then two months later it's like, okay, we're gonna take it back. But this doesn't, there seems to be, maybe it's even like a temporarily truncated period yeah, where you can operate and get in there and then make, claim it your own and then make the case for like, no, but these are, these are actually social goods that we should be working to provide and promote and then really go head to head and stay on that moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, I mean, hurricanes are spectacular, right? They hit, people uh, are without power for a few days, but what happens to sort of slow motion uh, issues that are not visible? that are more about public health issues. And I think this project, I mean, we're just starting out, but I think we want to think about how do you actually uh, deal with those longer scale issues that are less in the public eye or less in the media. So, yeah. Go. Uh, how does it relate to, to your work? Because you work with this large scale, um, also national institutions, like super heavily funded, and you work in there with those also with those atmospheres, but then within your work, I think maybe I was too captivated by the images, <laughs> so maybe here, but you mentioned <laughs> about this. How does it uh, trail out into these publics that actually have to mm -hmm. maybe deal or not deal with the consequences? Like we all know what the, the mines that were closed down here and how that impacted like London, uh, air quality in London, which is a, a decisive change of the, the, the loss of the pea soup is like yeah, yeah. also quite a good thing, but now we have all this like invisible pollution, and then the government hangs on New Cross Road, this like fake green signs, like mm -hmm. low emission area, which has absolute green traffic sign doesn't mean anything, so yeah. the low emission area also doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Does it impact into your work, and how do you <coughs> move in and out of that, or do you address that all? I th it's a really interesting question because, in a way, what I was talking about, the document, and, and what I've always thought of about as this kind of documentary burden, in a way. Um, you know, as I so I came from a background of sculpture, I increasingly used photography. And a lot of the sites that I've used have taken a long time to get permission to be there. But once you're there with a the camera, there's a kind of an expectation that somehow you're going to kind of tell a story, that you're going to give some kind of narrative history. And especially um, with more kind of politically charged situations like mine. So, so one of the series from that Subterranea um, show, and I don't think I've showed any of the images, but they were made um, at a tin mine in Cornwall um, called Beaver, which actually was the last mine that was closed by Thatcher. Um, and, uh, and what had happened as it had closed, it kind of flooded back. So they allowed me to kind of go down to the deepest parts of the mine that were kind of flooded. So, but I wasn't there to kind of, you know, give, give a kind of a documentary narrative of that. I wasn't using photography in that way. I think what really interests me is how science comes back into the kind of the realm of the kind of lived. And, and, and that separation 
that um, that idea that science is somehow, as well as it being really abstracted, the actual political closeness of science is abstracted as well, and it's kind of obfuscated. So, you know, when when I was asking those questions about how how is this not Star Wars? It's, it's really the kind of subtext of that is how do you make somebody care about this? How do you make somebody um, connect to it in a way that, that it doesn't just kind of wash past them like another piece of CGI? And, and so in a sense, I guess, you know, I'm back a step from what you're doing in terms of kind of participation. Because I think, you know, what I found really interesting in, in your talk was trying to think through that relationship between citizen science because in this country, you know, that, that mapping of meteorological data was one of the earliest kind of uses of citizen science before it was ever called citizen right. science that people right. were all contributing. But the relationship between that and the kind of mobilisation of people through participatory art practice right. and how those, how those two things, you know, work or overlap. Right. I'm sorry, I'm probably not answering your question, I'll turn it into a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm also really, I'm really interested in what you're talking about with the sort of the, the impossible space of these images, um, but how that's also still a practice uh, through this via abstraction, but also making something that's not legible, but right, to make these deep time images that used to be impossible possible. Uh, I think there's still that space within climate change where uh, it's still an unknown. It's a known unknown, but there's still this impossibility space that exists in the moment right now. Um, which I'm really fascinated with, sort of trying to uh, think through this kind of work and think through what is the possibility that this opens up for wider publics to even imagine uh, the new world that we live in, right? So. I guess, um, sorry, I'm sort of forming that question as I, as I speak here. I guess, I guess it's going back to something that you said um, about perspective. Um, and, and something you mentioned at the end of the presentation was um, was incorporating community fear yeah. into the into incorporating it into the model, and I guess that sort of stuck out with me, um, sort of bouncing up for your question again about the state, because um, you know we you know we've seen this shift, you know, not just with climate change, but other so social, technical, political frameworks where where the the capacity of fear has been weaponized mm -hmm. um, in accord with ideologies and logics that you know that sort of presupposed even this crisis that we call climate change, um, and how those mechanisms of fear have been used, of course, for different you know types of aims. So I, I guess the the first part of the question is 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 how are you avoiding by incorporating community fear, which itself is already infused with political, social, and economic fear, into a model um, that's supposed to be a speculative model? How do you avoid just a sheer replication of existing state apparatuses? Um, and I guess the sort of parallel question to that is is this sort of idea, um, and maybe they're sort of similar. Is this sort of idea of of documenting into the archive, whether that archive is something physical, you know, museum space, or um, which we see most often now in forms of the database, um, where we're you know extracting um, particularities, you know, abstracting them um, into a sort of archive to be um, preempted and sort of built and constructed later. Mm -hmm. um, but but what I'm thinking through is 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 the idea of you know something that Mbembe sort of talks about a bit about the archive in in how the perception of liberation is having visibility and access to the archive mm -hmm. and and it's perceived that the shift in power is basically if I only have access to the data then I can reconstruct my own narrative um, when in fact the the underlying notion behind that is even the original archive, the actual phenomenal, phenomenological account of what's happening locally in terms of climate disaster has already been reduced into and subsumed into an abstraction. So pulling that abstraction now just to repurpose it into a speculative framework mm -hmm. creates just a revisionist narrative that still doesn't account for the original right, phenomenology. So I guess I guess going back in this very long question is is be, because the perspective is already within existing structures, 
how how are you reaching past that to create any sort of predictive or speculative space that doesn't just replicate itself back into the same notions of mm -hmm. of of of, of fear, you, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, and I guess more basically, I'm saying like, if a if a community-based organization gets involved in community sciences and creates right. their own their own climate models, how is that how is that any different than you know? I'm thinking second order for cybernetics here, right? right. <laughs> how, just because you're yeah, participating, just because you're participating, your does it does it mean that you're actually subverting? Right. Um, and that's so. I'm, I'm just sort of think and this. It maybe it's a question to kind of kind of both like without revealing like these these spaces yeah. basically I, I guess what i'm saying basically the mechanism of power is what allowed these spaces to be abstracted and and what allowed the practitioner to actually actually take a detachment and say it's not phenomenological mm -hmm. so so by saying it you're actually engaging with power itself and maybe that's the power of power is to is actually a perception that actually you're not engaged when you actually are. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious on how. Sorry, that's a very. Yeah. Can I just jump on the fear thing really yeah. quick? Um, so the politics of fear, in my opinion, I think, is to make a population afraid of something and then provide a solution and then divide up who gets to have parts of those solutions, right? Uh, I think in our understanding is there is real fear of not only of the climate but of the state in these communities of what the state will do because of climate mm -hmm. and we're not trying to resolve this fear by saying here's some fancy model that you're part of now um, it's actually trying to think about how do you make the community processes of dealing and reacting to climate change that are happening right now that are happening because of toxicity of all kinds of different i mean flint michigan you, you could just there's a litany of places in the U.S. that are dealing with things like this right now that are not resolving the fear issue, but they are they are adapting and creating new forms of living with each other uh, despite the state. And that fear is powerful, and that fear is also part of care. Um, and I think that we're trying to we're trying to amplify that, but also uh, give a right to opacity to people who don't want to be made legible by the state in climate politics. So making legible on one side, here's the, ri the real risk that your community is facing, but also here's uh, a mask that you can hide behind and try to actually plan something um, while our organization is, is ipso facto the state or m mimicking the state, but trying to block the state's access to those communities. That's a crazy answer, but <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. no. But this is actually, no, coming back to your talk, uh, yeah. this is uh, blocking at least uh, the Haraway statement that if you yeah. provide a better description, it's a more just world. It's simply untrue. I'm pretty, yeah, well, I'm very skeptical of that, right? That the more we describe the world, the, the somehow better we're all going to be off. No. I think there's something about fiction. There's something about the fiction in these images, too, that yeah. creates this something very productive and something very yeah. interesting um, in building a relationship to the earth, but not only the earth, each other and the technology that creates this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. yeah. Would it make sense though to be somehow yeah. magical to more the hour, whether that be the state or I mean you showed the blur building and one of the really amazing perverse aspects of the blur building was it if you take away the, the smog and the, the, the smoke of it, is it it essentially was kind of all of these waters bottled from around the world right. being sold to the very occupants of the blur building. So you have already the blur building working within a commercial structure which is obviously owned by right. somebody, benefiting somebody, yeah. providing a profit for somebody. So the fiction that you would create should then somehow be part of a larger power structure that's already, well, failing, as you pointed out, but right. then still somehow yeah. moving forward. I, I mean, I think what we're trying to do is repurpose funding structures from universities and donors. Uh, to hopefully get those resources to communities that don't have access to them. And I understand the sort of fear of using commodification itself as some sort of radical tool. Um, I think what we're trying to do is... That's a given. At, at, what's that? That's a given. I mean, everything being... Right. right. A, well, yes. I mean, yeah. But I think what, what we're trying to do is just merely repurpose the tools of the state to actually help people. And, uh, 
I don't think that's very radical. I think it's just sort of trying to participate uh, and extend these networks of care that already exist and actually sort of try to broadcast them and maybe make them more widely known. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not that optimistic about it. That's what I'm <laughs> Because there's one way that that harrowing statement about more transparency, though, does still hold, which is, and I think yeah, I was reminded of it when you said that um, that fear is about creating solutions and parsing out those solutions to other people. There's also a kind of, like, fear isn't really a monolith that equally ex affects and sort of governs reactions across the board. There are diff there's one sort of, perhaps there's one fear that's mobilized, which then turns on and off other kinds of fears. So you keep talking, I keep thinking about how there was threats to people in the United States after these climate crises, that it was going to be a way in which the government was able to, um, people were literally being flooded out of their homes so it would bring out illegal immigrants and then that would be the repercussions of it. In which case, they would be able to, they'd have ICE waiting there. Yeah. And they had to have other states, local municipalities say, no, this is completely not founded. Yeah. Um, in which case, this, this transparency of like, no, the, of, of breaking down what the hierarchy, the ordering of fear and how fear is, Asymmetrically and unevenly mobilized and active. That seems like. Yeah. Yeah. Very well. There's something you said though about the long term. I mean, you guys yeah. both talked about sort of a longer period of time, whether it be geological with regards to the planetary or the universe, and then you with regards to care. Right. And what you're mentioning with regards to ice, it's not necessarily ice per se within the kind of next five years. But in the United States, you already see examples of um, the, the commodification that happens at a scale of like a property regime, like in the case of Detroit, where you have gentrification happening not because of the loss of industry, but because of race wars, um, faults of political you know, states not you know, taking care of the population itself. And the same thing in New Orleans. They, these, Spaces of trauma and conflict actually get become um, sort of tabula rasa for the kind of the, the whole process to repeat itself over and over again, so that you do have right. parts of the population just end up being completely marginalized. Hence, mm. or more so marginalized. Yes, exactly. Hence, mm. yeah. and I think that is what I think what your work is doing more is you you bring it you bring your camera, in this case, to that unknown, while you leave this level of opacity uh, intact by refusing that narrative, I think. So there is a... Um, hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think for me, what, one of the kind of subtexts of my research, um, and, and I work with a, a, a group called the Cultural Negotiation of Science, and, and it's across biomedical science and biomedical science, etc. Um, but it's really kind of resisting that instrumentalization of art by science. And I think often that has been the, um, the, the, the kind of really difficult thing that, that science is seen as complete and that art comes to it and interprets and communicates and becomes this kind of servant of um, creating a narrative for science. And, and to me, you know, I'm really trying to kind of break that down and, and to over quite long periods of time sometimes kind of kind of crack into that idea that, that science is complete and, and that, that they allow the art to actually start proposing different methodologies so in, in a way to be asked you know how, how does somebody connect with what you're doing they hadn't been asked that before you know even though it seems incredibly obvious to us you know they're, they're the, you know, a, a, a first year physics student will never be asked those questions. They were never proposed in any kind of um, in education environment for them about, about the kind of cultural perception of data. Um, so, so I think, you know, those, that, that, that way of um, kind of cracking open the, this kind of myth about the completeness of science or technology or kind of business is, is really important. So, yeah, that, that resistance is. Right. I think the two, the two are emerging sort of hand in hand. You know, I think that the, you know, 
obviously the sort of lay practitioner in the sciences, you know, isn't isn't afforded enough information about you know cultural technical forces or even ethics or so on and so forth. But but science has emerged in a new reflexivity. Where they're very much aware of their fallibility. They're very much aware of the inability to capture all of these sort of dynamics. But I guess my principal concern is in that awareness is another sort of, sort of logics of power because what's attached to that awareness is also a meta-narrative that basically says if I can incorporate the citizens to themselves fill in some of these gaps and thus they are participating. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it becomes it, another it, layer of co-option. It just yeah. becomes another, and, and, and what it's creating, and obviously it's being accelerated by algorithmic processes, things of big data, and what it's creating is, you know, going back to my previous statement, is a certain sense of delusion and detachment that actually, that actually by participating in power, I'm resisting power without questioning what's underneath. So if there's an algorithmic process or even that data model that's incomplete, and it's creating some sort of like, you know, there's a logic submerging that you too can participate to reverse it without questioning actually the, uh, the structures underneath that created the model in the first place. Um, so, in, and in that way, we, we, we've really gone back in time, basically, to the form of representation that just says, if I reverse the gauge, then thus it'll all yeah. go away. <laughs> And, and meanwhile, these structures will continue to sort of to sort of go. Yeah. 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 I just want to say thank you to everyone for all those really interesting points and the speakers. Um, really uh, amazing ideas. And uh, sort of go back to the kind of disconnected nature and disconnect to us, which you kind of kind of touched on a little bit at the at the end of that thing about how these processes through process-based uh, engagement through art and people. Um, can actually help us to connect to each other as well as to as well as to the, the uh, change in climate and what, how we can adapt to that. And the notion of fear is that um, kind of in us all anyway, it's a trigger that people use to sell us things. We know that, but I mean, I think that the notion of process-based art making within this um, kind of way of collaborating with different professionals and with people is a really powerful way. And you can't really pin it down. You can't say. I can't say that it's going to be used, it's used continually by power mechanisms to trip us up, of course, because that's the whole kind of the way that they work, but, but I think artists in a process-based sort of way of working and bringing people together is, a, is constantly a new and refreshing way of working that completely fucks that up all the time and kind of trips that up, and I think that, that we're not, you know, I'm not going to stop doing that because, because someone might want to abuse it or, or create it into a past situation. I think we should carry on doing it, find ways of, 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 uh, of doing that. Right, because this is what I identified these ways in which science or even software at one point or citizens are brought to science to kind of they're co-opted and then they become this sort of cooperative entity that does their bidding and their work for them but it seems like repeatedly art and aesthetics are sort of adopted just as brutally and stupidly it's just made to do the thing it's the tool that does the thing it visualizes and in actuality there's a kind of vibrant life and world that's happening in art practice in the creation and making of art and visualization aesthetics that's much less examined and perhaps, I mean, optimistically, maybe, but perhaps a little bit more liberatory or sort of texturing power. Um, I very selfishly took the last few minutes right now. <laughs> and, uh, it's five o'clock, so I think we need to hand over the space back to Carousel and Interface. So thank you, everyone, for coming. and really